and welcome to Hidden History Stories from the Secret City. I'm Keith McDaniel along with my co-host Ray Smith. Good morning, Ray. Good morning, Keith. How are you today? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Uh, uh, I look a little bit different today than I did yesterday. Did you see my post on Facebook, my picture? Yeah, I did. You are on her. I saw that. I, I, uh, <laughs> I, I was, there's a uh, feature film being shot in Knoxville uh, mm -hmm. that's part of uh, Knox Area Christian Ministries Association or something like that. And they do, they do a little project every summer and they're making a feature film. So I, I got cast as a, as a judge in the courtroom scenes. I was on set yesterday and at the courthouse in downtown Knoxville for, for a few hours. But uh, I, I saw that in your black robe. You you look right right regal in it. Okay. In my in my yeah. Well, that's the only time you'll see me like that. Yeah. Probably more often be in an orange jumpsuit, but that's all right. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to continue on with uh, Benita Albert today, Ray. We do. I'm really glad that Benita's continuing this series so we get it on our hidden history. And uh, this is the fourth of her uh, in in a series. I think, Benita, you think we're still will be able to finish up with, uh, with the fifth one? I suspect. I suspect we'll need to go. Yeah, that. and if We'll do that. And if we need to, we can even go beyond that. We want to get them all. And I must tell you that Benita's hard at work putting all of these stories into a book. And uh, I'm going to be real proud when we get that, get that book together. But for now, let's pick up where we left off, uh, Benita, and let's go on through uh, some of the other stories about the graduates from Oak Ridge schools. Thank you, Ray and Keith. Um... Good to be back. Good to brag on Oak Ridge students. And um, I should say, I, I probably should have said that back in the mid 80s, that starting there, many of these students are still quite active in their careers. And, uh, you know, whether the ones before or later, um, these people have full time jobs. So it was an honor to get them to agree to um interviews and, and a story and of course what i'm telling now is just a little snapshot of everything we told of their stories um but they are very very busy people and many of these stories that you'll hear about today were collected during the covid months when it was easier in some sense to communicate back and forth with them uh they couldn't travel they couldn't do things that uh, uh, restricted them more so i deeply appreciate all of them participating and the uh, students you're seeing on the screen now rachel moses graduated from oak ridge high school in 1995 um she started at Woodland School, went on to Jefferson Junior High and to Oak Ridge High School, and it, uh, it was just a fun, fun interview. We talked back and forth and reminisced for quite a long time just about Oak Ridge High School, and I thought I would mention um, a couple of the things she said back as far as elementary school. So she said, and I'm quoting her, I fondly remember all of my teachers. Now think about it, from K to 12, that's a lot of teachers. She knew them all. Yeah. And she named them grade mm -hmm. by grade. Mm -hmm. And she also said, I loved the diversity of Oak Ridge schools. She was talking about both students and teachers. Her first teacher was a a fine, wonderful Black teacher, Charlene Thompson, who many, many people know in this community. Rachel said, many of my friends were African-American. Now, Mrs. Thompson and I serve on the board of directors of Girls Incorporated. And she mentioned from Jefferson, teacher Teresa Venable, who went on uh, later to work um, at the Alex Haley compound um, as a librarian there uh, in Clinton. She said, Teresa Venable inspired my interest in civil rights and student rights. Let me tell you, she was a born lawyer. I do believe that. Um, 
And that is ultimately what she became. When I wrote this article, I wrote it not only about Rachel, but also about her brother, Adam, who became a lawyer. Adam graduated later. So I'll keep their story separate for the moment and continue with Rachel. She said in seventh grade at Jefferson, we had projects out the wazoo. I am quoting her. And uh, she said, I worried about that. And so I met with the principal, Robert Moss, to advocate for the school to make supplies available in the library, such as current events, publications, poster boards, and copying services to help many, many students who needed these resources, didn't have access to them, um, access outside of school. And as she mentioned, much less the financial support. She met with him and they did it. Huh. They being the administration to their credit. Rachel went on to Center College in Kentucky where she majored in government and she minored in math and sociology. Um, she was my student in AP Calculus. She could have taken on, I promise you, any field of her choice, but she had a passion for, uh, for representation of people. So she went from Center College to UT Law School. And during that time at UT Law School, she volunteered as a court representative for Anderson County as a special advisor in teen parent delinquency negotiations. She also interned with Rural Legal Services of Tennessee and worked with Neil McBride, noted attorney in the area, where she represented incarcerated juveniles in state detention. Um, she cited Neil McBride as her champion and her role model for lifetime advocacy, sorry, I can't say that word, for underrepresented people. She is now a rural legal advocate in the Middle Eastern and Cumberland Plateau region of Tennessee. And I'm quoting her again. She said, I handle special ed cases and attend IEP cases in rural areas. My cases cover family law, housing law, housing law, consumer law, employment, public benefits, and education law. And she said that, uh, you know, reflecting back on her education, she said, I'm often shocked by the lack of student resources available to students in her region. Services I never questioned um, or considered special in the Oak Ridge schools. She's been president of the Tennessee Bar Association of Young Lawyers from, that was 2014 to 2016. Um, and she is on the Tennessee uh, Bar Association Board of Governors currently, serves there currently. Um, she loves to travel, loves, loves um, everything she does. She, she just had such a passion for any course she was in, any cause she was for. I remember Rachel, and we laughed about it, showing up for every single holiday of note, Valentine's Day, Patrick's, whatever it was, in an appropriate costume for the occasion. She has a zest for life, and she um, displays it now in the uh, advocacy she she offers. So that's Miss Moses. All right. All right, Lauren Gray. What a pleasure to uh, make connection with Lauren. Again, one of my calculus students um, who went a very, very different route. You know, one of the things I have tried to do in finding alumni stories is, uh, of course, it's easier for me to find my students and talk them into uh, a kind uh, such an accommodation for me to interview and to let me write their stories. But um, uh, in, in doing that, I'm trying to find um, Oak Ridge High School's alumni here making a difference across ver a variety of fields. And oh my goodness, is Lauren making a difference. She attended Cedar Hill School before it closed and had to uh, then those uh, she had to transition to Woodland School. But during her fourth grade and half of her fifth grade, 
she studied at an international school in Norway because her father, Lenny Gray, who is a, a, a retired now Oak, uh, Oak Ridge National Lab mathematician, um, had a sabbatical in Norway for a year and a half. Um, and then, of course, she graduated from Oak Ridge High School. When I uh, talked to uh, Lauren about her school experiences, she went immediately to Oak Ridge High School and an expression of uh, love, literally, for history and English courses that she took there. And she mentioned especially um, she loved, and this would be very, very different uh, memories, perhaps across the uh, wide um, uh, span of alumni who've done the same, but she mentioned especially loving doing a major author project. It was a huge project uh, that uh, many, many of my students didn't necessarily love, but Lauren did, and she did that under um, a teacher she very much respected, Nada Fanane. Um, she called herself you know, a, a generalist nerd, which I find interesting because that is one of the features of many, many of uh, my wonderful students uh, in th that I taught in calculus. You know, she took advanced science courses, math courses, and also history and English. So where did that take her? She um, ultimately it became a leader in a huge philanthropy trophical uh, project, which I'll feature in just a minute. But before we get there, let's uh, mention that she was a member of the Oak Ridge High School swim team and ultimately uh, then swam at her undergraduate university, uh, Washington University in St. Louis. And she advanced to the team captain of the swim team in her senior year. She majored in comparative literature and minored in art and psychology. She sought a career in art administration, and so that meant she needed to go on, and she did, to get a master's in business art. <clears throat> her first job, <clears throat> I believe she interned here as well, but her first job was in New York City at uh, MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art. And it was while she was there that one of her fellow um, uh, graduate students reached out to her and said, I have a job that you, I think you would be perfect for, or I think you might consider. She joined the International Rescue Committee. She found her passion, she said, in helping refugees and addressing third world issues. She ultimately rose to the Director of Fundraising and Corporate Partnerships. And she was responsible, a big part, in their winning big monies. And I'll just mention one of those. They won a MacArthur grant to educate young refugees in the Middle East with an International Rescue Committee slash Sesame Street partnership. She traveled widely uh, um, with her work, and that included, you know, many trips to the humanitarian project sites that they worked. Um, she, um, through IRC, supported such missions as health, education, economic well-being, uh, empowerment, and safety. Within the past two years, since I wrote her story, I've heard from her parents um, that you know she has changed. She has now she is now with an organization called Welcome.us, and it is an organization that assists people in seeking US, United States refuge from war and violence. And in particular, if you visit their website to look at them, they are working with um, refugees from Afghanistan, Venezuela and Ukraine. Boy, is her work timely. Wow, that's great. <clears throat> All right, Chris Bunick, class of 1996, also went to Woodland in Jefferson and Oak Ridge High School. Um, Chris was just a, a ball of fire in my class. Uh, always, always heads up eager, let's take it on, whatever it is, you know, he just was fearless academically. 
um, when I talked to Chris, he, one of his first memories was of ninth grade at Jefferson and coach Dan DeGregorio's required science fair project. I'm quoting Chris. I borrowed from my father's Oak Ridge National Lab research. Uh, it was a NASA program sending crystallizations into space. I decided to see if I could grow better crystals here on Earth. This, my first foray into research, was the beginning of my career in structural biology. It was the spark that led to so much more. <laughs> and then, uh, I say this with great respect, but I understand. I, I'm going to quote him again. He goes, moves to the high school and he says, the teacher I feared the most was Mrs. Yokely, Carol Yokely, AP English teacher. However, the amount of writing I had to do to get where I am today and, con and continue to advance my career makes me realize that my early training in principles of writing and communication were essential. I thank her for that. That's what all teachers hope to hear eventually. <laughs> um, he played Oak Ridge High School soccer, was a star, and he went on to varsity play at Vanderbilt. Uh, unfortunately, that varsity play was uh, interrupted. I believe it was his junior year by injuries. Uh, but at Vanderbilt, he went all the way to both an MD and a PhD degree. Through his years, he continued studying uh, crystallography research. In fact, he said that the fact the the accumulation of credits, uh, college credits that he got from his o AP high school course course exams, um, allowed him to do independent research in labs at uh, Vanderbilt, and that that kept that uh, momentum alive. So Chris is now, oh, well, I should I should say this first. Um, he was accepted to Yale uh, for uh, his um, residencies, right? And he won intern of the year in his first year there. Um, his residency was in dermatology and he's done postdoctoral fellowship since then in the labs of the Nobel Prize winning uh, researcher Thomas Stites, uh, known for his research in ribosomes, chemistry and ribosomes. Uh, but Chris now is a professor at Yale Medical School. He sees patients two, week, two days a week as a dermatologist, and he works in a research lab he described his job, now Chris is good at math, but listen to this. He described his job as 40% clinical and 100% research. Um, he's believed to be the only board certified crystallographer and dermatologist in the United States. And he told me that for him, there's no better place than Yale because when Thomas Stites, the Nobel Prize winner, uh, retired, Chris assumed his laboratory and works in his laboratory now. He is the son of um, a scientist and a medical doctor uh, here in Oak Ridge, a beloved medical doctor, Elaine Bunik. And he has put both of their careers together in an interesting way. All right. All right. <clears throat> Ricky Jones, you know, I, I gave a talk to, um, I gave over, over two rather long lectures, a talk to teachers about what's happened to our kids, you know, where, where, uh, where I shared memories of theirs from their schooling and then where they are now. And I think honestly, that Ricky's story is among the most heroic of all the stories I wrote. I didn't know Ricky, did not have him in class. He was actually, his story was recommended to me by Keyes Philauer, who did know him. And uh, Keyes, of course, was a long, long-term 
uh, Robertsville teacher and coach and you know, later came to Oak Ridge High School when the ninth grade moved up as well. Um, but uh, I thank Keith so much for this story because it's truly inspiring. Ricky attended Willowbrook School, then on to Robertsville and to Oak Ridge High School. Let's go back, though, to his mother. His mother was vision impaired slash legally blind, and she attended Tennessee School for the Blind in Nashville. Ricky inherited his mother's impairment. Uh, by his sophomore year, his vision was 2,400. He's been totally blind the past eight years. His mother made the decision not to send him to Nashville to school, even though he qualified in his young years. She didn't want to be separated from him, from him for his elementary through high school years. So he stayed in the Oak Ridge Public Schools. And of course, there were challenges, but uh, his teachers and uh, Ricky's determination and other advocacies made it possible. He had special accommodations in school, but especially vexing to him, he reported to me later, were the state testing programs where, though he was given extended time of, you know, 150 uh, percent of what it would have been, it was never enough for him to read and complete the test. Later in his high school years, the state finally allowed exams to be read to vision impaired students. He was embarrassed, he said, by his thick yellow lens glasses as obvious indicators of his blindness, and he often refused to wear them. But he mentioned a, a really poignant, I thought, wonderful story of uh, what teachers do to accommodate. He mentioned his Robertsville geography teacher, David Scott. He said he, he often used, uh, Mr. Scott often used stand-up drills with students to identify places on a pull down map. So he'd line them up and uh, they would uh, advance in that line one at a time through the questions. And of course, of course, Ricky uh, was challenged to see, literally see any of it. But he said, Coach Scott always managed to give me sufficient clues while pointing to a location so that I could successfully answer and I felt like all the other students. He considers Keys Philauer his own personal superhero. Ricky was a basketball manager at Robertsville and at Oak Ridge High School later. Coach Philauer, I'm quoting Ricky now, Coach Philauer told me I had to keep my grades up so I could travel with a team. He allowed me to be a part of outside school activities and even drove me home afterwards. A secret Santa, and he questioned, he doesn't have proof that it was Coach Phil Hour, gave me a starter jacket, which I proudly wore every day, even in hot weather. Again, that feeling of inclusion. He said, I loved when Coach Phil Hour would say to me and to others around, there's my assistant basketball coach. Ricky played football amazingly from ninth grade till mid-year of the 12th grade. Uh, and, and he stopped at mid-year because he contracted mononucleosis and was very sick. He had surgery after high school on his left eye that left him blind and it left him blind in that eye, I should say. And he then decided that I better go on and take advantage of something called the Tennessee Enterprise Program, which helped train, uh, you know, handi uh, handicapping uh, conditions for a future career. And from there, he went to vending at the state capitol and into fast services. Um, and, and that work uh, included uh, becoming a night shift general manager of a uh, McDonald's. He also tutored at Tennessee School for the Blind and that association and others then made him um, the director, uh, 
allowed him to achieve the director of the Tennessee Association of Blind Athletics. Um, he ran the New York City Marathon in 2014. Amazing. That's 26.2 or three miles. I can't remember for sure. Um, and he did that with volunteer aides to guide him on both on both sides of him. Uh, but what's interesting about that is when he ran it, he had fractured his foot just uh, six weeks before the race and had stayed off of it primarily, but he didn't want to drop out of the race. And he completed it. It took him seven hours. Wow. Um, he went back in 2015 because he wanted to improve his time. And he did. He improved it to six hours. <laughs> and then he said, I think I've done enough. I think I've uh, challenged myself enough. So as director of the Blind Athletics, he organized uh, competitions across the state, um, created opportunities where they didn't exist in uh, school programs and outside of that, adult programs. Um, and then he chose later, this was just before COVID, um, to start a private consulting service. Uh, he's actually been in the Oak Ridge Schools consulting uh, that uh, consulting service he does with his wife, who is also visually impaired. And it's uh, training programs for adapti adaptive recreational or sports activities. He is such a positive man in spite of his challenges. Um, he finally, after being uh, hit by a bus in Nashville and um, uh, hurt quite badly, accepted the aid of a guide dog. And both he and his wife use those guide dogs now. And um, they are a part of his family, obviously. Very, very meaningful to them. Um, Ricky... Uh, is, is a heroic story, really a heroic story. And he's not done. His career is still yeah. up and running. <laughs> Sounds like he is uh, willing to meet a, a lot of challenges and yeah. be successful in them all. Yeah. All right. Now, you should recognize the name Moses because we've just talked about his older sister, Rachel, Adam graduated with the class of 2000 and uh, matriculated through Woodland and Jefferson to Oak Ridge High School. Um, it's funny what they remember and they honor when I ask interview questions. And uh, if you knew Adam, he was quite a character, uh, a, a sort of a, a brilliant student, I should say, uh, a gregarious student and energetic and whatever. Uh, and so when you reflect back on that, when I reflected back on that, one of the first comments out of his mouth uh, was about his seventh and eighth grade English teacher, Mrs. Gully. I believe that's Jane Gully. Uh, he said, I can never forget her because she taught me a lot about character. Specifically, stereotyping isn't funny. It's harmful. Um, yeah, that's an important lesson to learn around that age, right? Around the middle school to high school age. He also mentioned me. He said, AP Calculus installed a logical method of problem solving that I use daily as an attorney. And then the other thing, generically, he had to, to make a big point on was that he loved the diversity that he experienced in Oak Ridge High School and in his neighborhood. And I'm quoting Adam. Our street had families from India, Sri Lanka, China, and Peru. Wow. And he mentioned that, you know, uh, that was just a, a enriched experience for him that he's not sure many, many people could, uh, could claim. Both he and Rachel spent their summers as, uh, I would say, probably from fifth grade up in travel experiences with the Children's International Summer Village. 
Adam went on to major in math. He was a brilliant math student at Emory before transferring then on to Tulane Law School. And he chose Tulane because he said it had the New York connections, lawyer connections that I wanted, that I always wanted to live in New York City. So that's where he is. He's an immigration lawyer in New York City representing elite status, I'm quoting him, clients. And he said that's namely celebrities and major business recruits. But he is also represented because Adam Wood, he would choose to do this, blue collar workers from such as the Dominican Republic and Guyana, where he says, I really learned the basics of immigration law. And he said that's somewhat different from, you know, some of his colleagues in the larger uh, uh, um, in, in, in his um, law firm, I should say. I asked him, okay, what's next, Adam? He was always, always so energetic. And I said, are, are you considering becoming a judge in the future? He replied, I really love debate and the challenge of strong representation of clients. I would miss that too much, I think. Hmm. Wow. So Rachel took a, uh, a rural legal path uh, and representing, you know, much, uh, most of her work, uh, uh, underrepresented people, Adam does, uh, do that as well as represent elite clients, as he puts it. What a broad spectrum he has to deal with. Huh? Yes, indeed. All right. Miss Ellen Reed, a beautiful inside and out student and now music composer. Ellen also attended Woodland, Jefferson, and Oak Ridge High School, and since then she has been so busy. I'm going to lead with her latest, well, there may be one after this that I don't even know about, but her latest claim to fame was as a young, young person, and you know she graduated in 2001 from Oak Ridge High School. In 2019, she won the Pulitzer Prize for her opera, Prism. Mm. She's been busy, really busy. Her memories, she remembered third grade teacher Inger Scudder. And here I'm quoting Ellen. She gave author teas where students would read their original stories. And she had a poster board rocket ship travel to the planets to inspire our learning the multipl multiplication tables. She was very active in the high school, in particular in the arts. Um, she participated in theater, both at school and at Oak Ridge Playhouse. Um, she was a show kid, uh, a singing, dancing group, and, and many other examples. And she was socially conscious in a way that uh, required she make known her advocacy. And what she did earned her a Horatio Alger Award, a national award. She organized, this was while she was at Oak Ridge High School, she organized a racial reconciliation art camp in Oak Ridge called Youngsters in Unison. Um, and, and she organized that for increased access and contact across racial and socioeconomic barriers. She went to Columbia University. She dreamed of that, she said, for years before being accepted and majored in computer music and ethnomusicality, which is a study of music in social and cultural contexts. Uh, and from there, immediately, she went to Thailand, to an international school in Thailand for a year. Um, and, and she was, quote, a music teacher, music instructor. She created a class for girls in music, which didn't exist before. It was exclusively for, for girls in, in music. And laughed 
to say that um, she asked the girls, you know, what what music do they like? What music do they want to sing? And right away they said, oh, we want to sing Avril Levine songs. Now, do you guys know Avril Levine? Oh. <laughs> well, probably because you don't know punk pop rock. <laughs> But it had reached Thailand, right? And she said, I had to listen to it. And she says, but that's what we did. We sang her songs plus many, many others. But uh, uh, interesting that that became part of her challenge. Um, the second year in Thailand, she was involved in it. This was a fellowship program, all of this. Uh, she was involved in operatic theater work. And thus, uh, perhaps her her first dive into what became a Pulitzer Prize project later. Um, she now works on both U.S. coasts. She's in New York City part of the time, and she's in Los Angeles part of the time. She's worked closely with the Choral Society there, the or 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 Orchestral Society in Los Angeles. Her opera, Prism, offers an honest and searing look at the victimization suffered in sexual assault. And one other mission she's taken on, she personally recruits fellow artists in uh, music and perhaps other fields, I'm not sure of that, uh, to, mention, to mentor young aspiring artists. And they do that via a Skype composition lab called Luna Composition Lab. And in summary, she um, spoke to her career passion and it was beautiful. It was simple and beautiful. Art is about sharing your better self. Hmm. I, I'm going to add a quick story to this that I didn't cover in the um, uh, story I wrote that I had student, I had Ellen as a student in my AP calculus class her senior year. And that year um, was a, a very special year in my memory in that I had a brilliant, brilliant uh, young autistic student who um, took the course as well. And that student faced many challenges, many uh, uh, long learned and difficult to overcome challenges. Ellen Reed, who was not given any direction by me or anyone else, chose to sit next to him and to help him sort of keep up, find the page, um, help him with his distractions. And I must tell you, he adored Ellen. Of course, anyone would who had that sort of attention but it was special, special attention and nothing required of her. What a young lady. Yes, she was certainly a young lady. She was about the same age as my youngest son, Zane. So I, I knew her somewhat. Just, mm -hmm. but she's brilliant. very talented. Yeah, very talented. All right, John Pennyman also graduated with Ellen in the class of 2001. And, you know, I find it interesting when I'm looking for alumni stories to look across different uh, fields and his is the field of religion. John Pennyman uh, came here during his time in middle school. So he started at Jefferson Middle, middle School and went to Oak Ridge High School. He moved from DC, from uh, Washington, DC. Um, it was actually during the seventh grade. I saw my notes here. Um, and his memories are bittersweet and uh, incredibly uh, special in many ways. But he says the most profound impact on his life may have been the loss of a close friend and Oak Ridge High School baseball teammate during high school. That friend was Kevin Kalia. He said it had an, a, profession, a profound impact on me. And then he cited Carol Yokely's um, mentoring through this time. He appreciated her kind guidance of her class through discussions of the death. 
And he said about it, I quote him, no platitudes. We just had honest talk about grief. And she listened. Also at Oak Ridge High School, he remembered falling in love with ancient Roman history under Dennis Rush, his teacher. He, uh, John was self-deprecating in saying this, but I will uh, mention it because he said it. He claimed he was a solid B student at a very competitive Oak Ridge High School. A solid B is great, right? Who was surprised when Nita Ganguly, his AP uh, science teacher, environmental science teacher, encouraged him to attend special UT seminars and lectures on environmental issues. She wanted him to reach beyond his academic course experience. And he said, I wasn't one of the A students. Why did she choose me? Nita saw what was in him. He worked on the um, Oak Log, the senior yearbook, or the, 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 I'm sorry, the school yearbook with teacher Jennifer York. And that convinced him that his future career should be in journalism. But all of the above intermingled to lead him to a PhD from Fordham University in the history of Christianity. He's now a professor of religious studies at Bucknell University. He authored and published his first book in 2017. That book is entitled Raised on Christian Milk, subtitled Food and the Formation of the Soul in Early Christianity. Uh, he is on sabbatical in Greece, I, I has been on and off. When I talked to him, he had been canceled because of COVID. He eventually got there sometime in 2021 and uh, went there specifically to research his next book, which he had already titled, and I will quote that, Christ's Pharmacy, subtitled The Making of an Ancient Drug Culture. He's a phenomenal thinker, writer, ethicist, and theologian. And there's no way I can adequately express uh, except to quote him. And so I'm going to read a paragraph from the article I wrote on him. This is, um, you know, part of his interview as I started, right? My final request I made of John was to speak to his spiritual side, and if he would, to offer comforting words for the current trying and uncertain times we have faced in the first half of the year 2020. And that included COVID. Um, I believe the George Floyd death had happened at the time we talked, uh, whatever. His thoughtful answer follows. I quote him. As is probably clear by now, my own journey through religion, spirituality, has been complicated. I was baptized by the Catholics in Ohio, and then a second time in a swimming pool in Oak Ridge. I've answered altar calls with evangelicals. I've stood very still with Presbyterians. I've gone through all the meaningful motions with, with Episcopalians, and I've done church, he put in quote, in bars and homes and parks and temporary storefront spaces. I was a youth minister in college and was a pastor's husband for about a decade. I find the Christian story with all its attendant practices and contradictory interpretations overflowing with beauty and richness. Yet, I find the history of Christianity just as vexing and troubling, just as often tilted toward violence and wrath as it has been toward grace and mercy. The poet Ann Carson once wrote, my religion makes no sense and does not help me. I pursue it. Those words have become for me a personal mantra as much as they are a professional motto. Isn't that beautiful? It is, absolutely. Mm. He's quite the writer. Yes. 
Well, do we have time for more? All right, we're gonna go to Miss Molly. One more. All right, let me find her here because I've got notes that I, yeah. Okay, so Molly, interestingly enough, grew up in the Oliver Springs school system from kindergarten through grade eight and chose to transfer to Oak Ridge High School um, at, at the beginning of high, uh, at the beginning freshman year um, at Oak Ridge High School. She is the daughter of the Oak Ridge High School business teacher, um, Gail Brown, now deceased. Uh, Gail was a personal friend of mine, was um, the department coordinator for business, uh, a long-term educator and a beloved friend. And so it was great to get to talk to Molly. I did not have the privilege ever of teaching her, but I certainly knew of Molly. Um, she walked into Oak Ridge High School and became Miss Involved. I mean, a natural leader. She was selected to uh, from, from Oak Ridge High School for Girl State. She was a four-year SECME member, and SECME stands for Southeastern Consortium of Minorities in Engineering. She was their senior year president, SECME senior year president, and she was also the Tennessee state president of Future Business Leaders of America. Busy girl. Um, the summer before her senior year, she entered an intensive introduction to business program at North, Northwestern University, <coughs> excuse me. And then ultimately um, got her undergraduate degree from Northwestern in uh, those degrees actually were two of them in political science and international studies. During those college years, um, at, at, during the summers, she worked for two years at the Oak Ridge National Lab in environmental science, and she spent two years interning in the Anderson County Juvenile Court. So she hit the world of work with an interesting, broad resume of not only leadership, but um, strong, strong experience and uh, academics. And she rose to the top, as I put it. She is a civil servant, but a very, very important civil servant to the United States. She now serves as the deputy program manager for U.S. Navy Strategic Programs Command. And at that job, she, I'm quoting her, she uh, does the following. I ensure Navy facilities are prepared to execute inspections per the New START Treaty with Russia regarding nuclear deterrence measures. I enjoy working Navy bases and meeting sailors on the Ohio class submarines who are protecting our nation and the world daily. Um, she attends the annual joint conference meetings between Russia and the United States, which are held in Geneva, Switzerland, as the advisor to the joint chiefs of staff. Um, you may have heard of the New START tr Treaty recently. Yes. Because Russia has now said, I believe it lasts through 2026. I don't have it here in my notes, but I believe that's right, that they will not rejoin that treaty. And it's as a result of the Ukraine war and uh, differences. Um, I have not talked to Molly. I have no idea, you know, what um, uh, her future involves, but she will certainly be retained by the government as someone of great, great importance to them. Um, Molly was, uh, it turned out, the descendant of a story that I picked up on, Ray, because uh, in, in telling that story, um, I discovered her, it would be her mother's sister, her aunt, yeah, was um, a significant story in and of herself. Molly is, I believe it's the third great, three great um, granddaughter of a slave that worked uh, 
on a um, plantation uh, in Oliver Springs or near Oliver Springs. It wasn't called Oliver Springs at the time. It had a different name, but as we know it, Oliver Springs. And uh, the interesting part of that story, uh, that sis, uh, that aunt, by the way, is Julia Daniels. The interesting part of that story is roughly 100 years later, her family bought a section of that farm and Molly was raised um, on the farm. It was a part of the plantation. That's that's amazing history. Yeah, and she's you know she's proud of her history, proud of how important her uh, uh, family has become to the history of the area and leadership in the area. Now, the Julia Daniel's story was a delight for me to uh, grab onto and be able to write as well. Yes, I, I enjoyed that and encouraged you to follow that trail. And it's amazing when you think about. Uh, the history of what would be three, three or four generations going from a slave to an uh, an advisor to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Right. Amazing right. family history. And Molly certainly is a very important individual in that position. And of course, the connection to Oak Ridge is obvious because uh, we provide the secondaries for those nuclear weapons that are on the Navy ships. Mm -hmm. And we also understand the requirements of the START Treaty. And as far as that goes, we're moving in, in uh, the direction of continuing to reduce nuclear weapons to the levels agreed upon in that treaty. I don't know what the coming negotiations may result in, especially with uh, Putin's desire to Increase nuclear weapons, I believe, mm -hmm. as well as China's. So uh, that's a very volatile situation in, in the world. And she's right there in, amid, in the midst of it, for sure. Okay. All right. Keith, we'll uh, pick that up again next time from the, sure. that location and move on with the very interesting stories of these individuals who... <laughs> without exception, are, are world-renowned in their fields and are doing some tremendous, tremendous work. Uh, I find it, it interesting, you mentioned Lauren Gray and what she's doing internationally. And of course, her mother uh, is so proud of her. And uh, I've talked to her about it and Judy Gray, and she is uh, she's amazed at what her daughter's doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and rightly so. But all of the ones that you've covered today for us are just examples of what Oak Ridge has produced. And we talk a lot about Oak Ridge and the scientific discoveries that we have here that impact the world. It's not only the discoveries, it's the people coming out of Oak Ridge that are impacting the world. Absolutely, absolutely. And we're gonna be back in a couple more weeks uh, with Benita again. And I think we're going to try to maybe wrap this series up with the next one in a couple of weeks, yep. if we can. I think we can. We'll we'll give it a shot. If not, we'll go another week if we need yeah. to. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's give uh, folks a little bit of a sneak peek of what we got planned. We've got something special planned coming up in July, right? And we've got a special guest that we're going to be that's going to be with us. So let's give a little bit of a teaser. Why don't you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I'll be glad to. Kai Bird is the author of the book, The American Prometheus, which is about uh, Robert Oppenheimer. And of course, Christopher Nolan is making a movie that'll be coming out on July the 21st about Oppenheimer. Now, in addition to that, there's a documentary being produced by NBC that should be coming out the latter part of this month. And Oak Ridge has planned uh, at least three things associated with this activity. The first one will be on the 19th of July when uh, <clears throat> the documentary film, the NBC's documentary, will be shown at the high school. And then we're going to have a panel discussion about the documentary uh, that, that evening as well. And then later that week on the 20th, which is the day before 
uh, the movie actually comes available on on theaters across the nation. Oak Ridge has gained the, the uh, ability or the privilege of showing the movie one day early. <clears throat> and uh, the Explore Oak Ridge, Katie Watt, is leading the effort. Uh, she's already rented one theater, and she has the option to add another one if needed. And uh, if you go to Oak Ridge, Explore Oak Ridge online, you can find the details about purchasing tickets. All the proceeds or the profits from this effort will go to the Oak Ridge History Museum in support of that volunteer effort that we have in town. And uh, it'll be at seven o'clock in the evening at the uh, at the Tinseltown Theater to get a one day early viewing of the Oppenheimer movie. That which, is, I, which by the way, is is three hours and nine minutes that? long, or three hours and nine seconds long, I believe. <laughs> I knew it was close to three hours, I, and I, I'm amazed. That's that's going to be a lot of a lot of information coming out. And well, oh, well oh, it's very it's, hard to get mentioned at least in it. Oppenheimer wasn't here, but he he had to do had to have Oak Ridge to do what he did. You know, it's interesting that I saw. Uh, Matt Damon, who plays General Groves in the film, he was talking about it. He's seen the film, obviously, and he was talking about it. He says, yeah, somebody asked him about the length of it. And he says, it, it goes by so fast. He says, you don't even need an intermission. He says, it does not seem like that. Yeah, and right. Also, uh, Christopher Nolan talks a great deal about the process of making the film and that part of it is in black and white and part of it is in color and the black and white portions are things that are historically accurate wow. okay there okay. there it's it's almost it's not documentary style but these are things that are in the record that actually happen the way that he portrays them and the color part is really from uh oppenheimer's perspective wow. um, the way okay. things are are done so this is kind of a it's kind of an interesting and new and unique way of, of storytelling for Christopher Nolan, but um, the the and the the Oppenheimer movie is Ray, as you know, uh, what's his name, Kai Bird. Yes, uh, yeah. Is, the the is, is based on greatly based on on Kai Bird's book, right. Amer the American Prometheus, in which we will have and we're going to have him on. Yes. Uh, in July. Uh, 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 we'll interview him. I believe it's July the 8th. Yeah. So it will be before all these events and before the movie comes out. So. And, and I must tell you, Kai, and we'll we'll talk about this when he's on. He was here at Oak Ridge for a gala at the American Museum of Science and Energy. Yeah. And I had, had the opportunity to spend about three hours with him. Mm -hmm. out at Calhoun's <laughs> yeah. for a dinner event and uh, really enjoyed getting to know him. And he uh, he will be obviously at the premiere in Los Alamos, which they'll have on on the twenty first. Mm -hmm. By the way, Pat Postman is going to be out there, and oh, she's, she? she's going, she has a home in in Santa Fe as well. Right. She'll be there during that time of July, so she's going to the premiere. Wow! That's Don't great. blame her. I would too if I was out there. Exactly. Uh, additional. Uh, to the events surrounding the movie, uh, the Oak Ridge National Laboratory is considering having a forum about a month later uh, to talk about the movie and, and what people have seen, <clears throat> but also to bring more attention to what has happened in Oak Ridge since the Manhattan Project. In other words, what's come out of this that people may not even be aware of, just like what Benita's doing about people who are here. Think about it. <clears throat> this place called Oak Ridge wouldn't exist except for the Manhattan Project. Yeah. And that brought something in place that has over the years now impacting a uh, worldwide impact in so many cases, not just the students coming up out of here, but the scientific discoveries that uh, will be featured in a discussion about by the scientists at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So we're looking at a, a few weeks here of some interesting opportunity because someone who the statue of Christopher Nolan decided it's important enough 
to to bring this to the to the masses to the public sure. and i'm really glad really glad to see that and oh by the way you need to know that kai bird was instrumental in helping to convince the department of energy to vacate that decision where they took oppenheimer's security clearance away from him one day before it would have expired so they wow. just want to smack him you know uh, and and people were they were treating him awful at that time and I'm that sure. impacted the rest of his life mm -hmm. he uh, went down into the caribbean and stayed for a, a much of the rest of his life it was yeah. Horrible the way he was mistreated. And at least the Department of Energy has recognized that and has vacated that decision. Well, I'm really I'm really looking forward to seeing Oppenheimer. I mean, and, and folks need to remember this is not a documentary. I mean, there's going to be things, you know, and I've, I think I've said this before, you know, Tom Hanks talked to talked about, he said, when he talked to somebody that he's going to portray in a movie, he'll go to them and say, you know, I'm going to say things you never said. I'm going to do things you never did. I'm going to go places you never went. You know, <laughs> this is this is Hollywood. And, you know, if they can get a, a portion of it accurate, right. then we, we should all be pleased with the exposure that it's given. Um, also, there's one other thing that I was that I was going to mention. Oh, about the about the film and in an interview I read with Christopher Nolan, he talked about when he was shooting, actually shooting in Los Alamos, they were shooting some sections in Los Alamos. He said there, there were several scenes where they needed quite a few extras for it. And he said, so they recruited scientists from Los Alamos <laughs> National Laboratory to be extras. And yeah. even some of them had some lines and they knew exactly what they were talking about when the, where the professional Hollywood actors had no idea what they were talking about. Yeah. These guys could talk about it and be convincing. So I'm really looking forward to it. And I, I didn't want to go on too far about it because we've got several weeks, but, yeah. but I'm just really, but, really looking I, I, forward to it. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that part about the distinction between the colored part and the black and white part. Yeah. I, I have not heard that before. And I, I think that that gives me uh excitement to learn about how he's going to portray the actual history and and i i realize the, 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 the it, they will make they will portray it in such a way that it continues to carry an interest for the audience so they'll do and say things that might might not be exactly accurate but knowing that he's looking at it so close and being so careful mm -hmm. uh, to portray the actual history as a historian, that intrigues me, sure. and I'm so thankful that someone of the caliber of Christopher Nolan oh, yeah. is doing this. I, I Absolutely. think it has tremendous credibility to what's being done. Absolutely, and one one other thing, and I'm going to nerd out just a little bit. I'm going to film nerd out just a little bit. I saw a video clip this week with Christopher Nolan, and he was standing a movie, and, and of course, <laughs> most movies today are all digital, okay? Yeah. Rarely unless it's on IMAX, which is what he shot this on, which is 70 millimeter film. You know, size film. Um, it's all projected digitally. Well, he was standing at the film projector, which is a, a platter, it's a flat platter. And um, he had the entire film on that platter and it had to be six to eight feet in diameter, wow. the film did. And he says uh, that the the film, the three hour film, if you stretch the film out, it would be eleven miles long. <laughs> oh my God. It would be eleven miles long. So, <laughs> so anyway, but yeah, we're, I'm looking. Yeah, we're we're going to watch all eleven miles of it in three That's exactly hours. Exactly right. That's exactly right. All right. Well, Benita, right. we'll see you in a couple of weeks. And Ray, we'll see you. And folks, thanks for watching. We appreciate it. And we'll be back in a couple of weeks.